Hello. On this episode, um, I'm very pleased um, to welcome a guest who needs no introduction for many of my subscribers. But for those of you who are unaware of his work, consider this a lesson. He's been a big influence on my work. Um, he's been a member of Britpop Legends Collapsed Lung, and I would say the inventor and king of chat pop, which might be controversial, um, who can throw a rhyme like no other. He's well versed in cardinal sartorial rules, but is unafraid to break them. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. B, the gentleman rhymer, aka Jim Burke. Hi, Jim. Hello, hello. How's you? I'm not too bad. I hope you're keeping okay with all of this craziness that's going on at the moment. Well, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's not so bad. <laughs> I'm actually, I've reached a point this week when I'm suddenly conscious that I, I, like, where, I'm not earning any money. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, you know, I, well, not that I'm, you know, skint or anything, just the fact that I don't feel, there's certainly been something, you know, over the years of, you know, you do a gig, you make some money out of it. There you go. Yeah. There's, there's your living being earned. Whereas now I'm just sort of, uh, you know, hustling, <laughs> which is which is fine. You know, I, I enjoy the hustle. It's going to take me back to the old days before I had a nice, you know, calendar full of shows and what have you. Yeah. It's back to the days of thinking, right, what do I do now? What happens <laughs> now? So uh, well, I guess we've all had to find a new way of working with all of this, haven't we? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, this is it. It's um, yeah, it's all quite bizarre. <laughs> it's nice. I mean, I kind of I have enjoyed the fact, you know, I, I have spent the last, you know, 13 years just endlessly, endlessly gigging. So it's quite nice to sort of had a little breather and taken stock. But the problem with taking stock is suddenly you wake up some mornings and go, who actually am I? What, yeah. What am I anymore? You know, I've <laughs> been this thing for the last however many years and suddenly I'm just a bloke who wakes up and puts his clothes on at, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I get that feeling. I've been exactly the same. Uh, for, for, mm. for me, in many ways, it's been a bit weird because I just started to get regular gigs um, and it was just all starting to happen. Um, and then suddenly it's been smashed and unceremoniously taken away. Yes. Um, and we're having to adapt um, and Absolutely. into a new, a new world order, so to speak. Indeed. Um, Wait, we'll that, sounds like a, that sounds like a conspiracy theory. Start. <laughs> yeah. Let's not start with a new world order. We could be here all day. No, that's not good. I mean, we'll get on to talking about what you've been up to um, during this whole lockdown process. Sorry, just taking a swig of tea. Of course. Um, but just for a bit of background, um, how long have you been doing the Mr. Be the Gentleman Rhymer act because i first came across you from the straight out of surrey video was that was the first right time i saw you and that was what 12 years ago or something like that um yes probably was about 12 years ago yeah something like that gosh yeah i think the first yeah the first thing i did well, i think i came up with the whole thing it all happened relatively quickly i came up with the whole thing around about summer of 2007 yeah it was funny i was um i put together it was all part of, you know, it was a, a culmination of everything I've done in, done in the past. It was sort of, you know, being in a, you know, various hip hop bands and producing and uh, I was in a Banjo Lady covers band and a sort of dandy punk band. And I was quite into this chap, the whole chappy thing. So I thought I'd see what happened if I brought the whole thing together. And I made a video called A Piece of My Mind, which is about, that came out about September. Actually, must, yeah, must have been September 2007, but I'd recorded it before. And before this, I think one of the things I was doing was called Sergeant Rock. Right. And at the same time, a different thing I was doing under the name of Button Up, which was sort of Anglo-Irish hip hop thing. <laughs> it was me and a, a friend from Belfast. Uh, we were touring in Japan and the Sergeant Rock thing I did, we had an album out and we got signed and loads of it was used for ads and, and films and TV and what have you, but it sold absolutely nothing. But um, we went and did a, a tour in Japan and a lot of these Japanese promoters we were with, we realised were absolute sort of music geeks. And the first night we were doing a show in Osaka, we went for dinner with them, and I, you know, they were you know talk, chatting away to me in in you know slightly sort of pidgin English, and uh, we, uh, I said, oh, I used to do a thing called Sergeant Rock. I went, Sergeant Rock. I said, yes, yeah. No one over here knew what Sergeant <laughs> Rock was. And then suddenly there was all this chatter went around the table. They go, Sergeant, Sergeant Rock, Sergeant Rock, Sergeant Rock. <laughs> 
I was like, all right. And it turned out they, they were all big fans of the Sergeant Rock stuff. And so uh, and they had a record label and they said to me, oh, we'd really like to put one of the Sergeant Rock tracks out on a, our label compilation. It's called Second Royal Records. Yeah. And at that time, I didn't, it was MySpace years. So I had a Sergeant Rock MySpace and I put a piece of my mind on the Sergeant Rock one just to sort of pop it up there. And they, I said, oh, what track do you want to use? And they said, oh, we want to use a, a piece of my mind. I was like, oh, well, that's not actually Sergeant Rock. That's the thing I'm doing could, called Mr. B, the Gentleman Rhymer. And they're like, okay, we want to put that out. And so they put that out. And sadly, after that, we, we came back from this tour. We did a few gigs over there. And this band I was in called Butternut, we had a CD out over there. And because that's, you know, it's in the days when you just released a CD. And that yeah. was it. That was the format. <laughs> CD, nothing else. No vinyl cassettes, no doubt. Nice and easy. Nice and straight. CD. <laughs> and uh, when I spoke to the, the promoter when we got back and I'd sort of said, oh, you know, how, how did the sales of the album go after the tour? And he went, oh, surprisingly badly. So, oh, okay. <laughs> and then prob- I think had the sales not gone badly then, I think they may have wanted to get Mr. B out to Japan. So I could be one of those, you know, big in Japan type yeah. people. But um, yeah, he said, oh, I think it's going to be, di- it's difficult to sell hip hop over here at the moment. So we're not going to go with it. I was like, ah, oh, damn it. But then I did go out a couple of, a few years later and did some Mr. B shows and they were an enormous amount of fun. But um, yeah, it would have been, it was, a, I think if I'd have pushed it a little bit more, I'm just not a very pushy man. If I'd right. pushed it more, it's possible we could have done something out there. But anyway, that was the very first Mr. B thing was the summer of 2007 on a Japanese compilation. <laughs> There you go. That's I was chatting to the, um, the chaps from the um, New Sheridan Club because I played a gig for them a couple of years ago mm-hmm. before everything kicked off. And they booked yes. you very early on, didn't they? They did. I think the first, yeah, it must have been the Christmas do they had in 2007. Yeah. So that was a very early, early show. But uh, it was really good fun. That's the thing. Was I think I'd realised I was onto something. And the very first gig I did was actually... Well, 13 years ago, last Thursday, I think it was, or something like that. <laughs> and it was a little festival called Frogstock. And it was one of those things uh, uh, that I had, you know, I finally got a Mr. B page on MySpace and had a couple of tunes on there. And then I got a message from this chap saying, oh, you know, I'm putting this festival on. And we'd really like to have you play. So I thought, well, I better write some more tunes <laughs> because I've only got like three. So I got about a 20 minute set together and played there. And the guy that did the sound there happened to be chap used to do the collapsed lung sound and uh, when i finished playing he came up to me afterwards and said i'm not being funny or anything but that's the best thing you've ever done (laughs) okay and then uh, we made some little three quid you know cdrs of like four tracks or something and they sold out in about 10 minutes afterwards and uh, so yeah i immediately thought this is interesting and also the fact that back in the collapsed lung days i remember being at a festival and you know, we were on the we were, well, we were on the main stage at Reading, and I remember walking along with my brother, who's just under two years younger than me, and seeing this young kid with a collapsed lung T-shirt on. And my brother was nudging me and going, "Oh, here we go, here yeah, fanboy moment." And this kid just sort of walked past me like that, <laughs> just looked straight through me, and paid me no attention whatsoever. Whereas as soon as I turned up at this gig in a little field in Suffolk. Um, yeah, as soon as we walked through the gates, I was like, "Oh, it's Mr. B!" And <laughs> so it really shows being recognised. That's the uh... well. It's just, it's just there's something to be said for having a look. I think that's the thing, having a particular look. Definitely. Whereas you know, in the clap song days, it was the '90s, so everyone was just t-shirt and jeans. Well, the everyone great thing is, is if I don't dress up, I get ignored and people don't recognise me. Yes, um, yeah. But if I do dress up, then there is the danger. There is always the danger that someone goes, like, oh, "The no more fuck sky." Yes, exactly. <laughs> At the same time, as it was, it was Lady Thee, like Caroline, my wife, who said early on, once the moustache had grown anyway, just sort of said, you know, if you go out, you should probably dress a bit Mr. B-ish because people are going to think you're a, a big phony. <laughs> you know, people are going to think you're a faker, and that's, especially with it being a hip-hop thing. Yeah. I do feel like you have to kind of keep it real, although... Uh. You know, you can cosplay it. It's fine, really. <laughs> but I had just had that. I think, again, again, I had that kind of early 90s hip hop thing where you've got to, you don't turn up at a show and put your clothes on. You just no, turn you, up there. You have you to know, turn up to the show clothes. in your actual. Yeah, you've got, um, you just wear that. But you need to be able to go incognito as well, I think, sometimes. This is true, yes. I've just actually recent, recently bought some prescription sunglasses, so that's a start. <laughs> and of course, you know, the fact that we have to wear masks everywhere now is, can be quite well, that's handy. it. That's it. Um, and I bet your glasses 
get steamed up quite massively with the masks do they they do a bit i mean you do learn techniques <laughs> you do learn if you put if you put the glasses over over the nose bit and so that you know it's pressing down on the top of the cloth then you tend to breathe out the side uh, <laughs> so all the steam goes out the side <laughs> so you kind of get away with it um so i mean you talk about um hip-hop um being your your big influence there um what yes how what a kind of hip hop artists thought of your act? So serious hip hop artists have they commented or said anything about it? Uh, yeah, well, there's been a few moments. Um, so I think who's been in well things like Nile Rogers, obviously of Chic fame, who wrote the original guitar riff that was used on Rapper's Delight. Yeah. He sort of retweeted it, and well, the sad thing is one of those ones. It was quite a while back, and he, and sadly it was one of those moments when. We actually had a little to and fro on Twitter and like a few, you know, a few DMs and what have you. And because he'd, he'd posted up and said, too funny and dope, which is something I use as a poster quote to this day. <laughs> because, you know, if Nile Rogers is going to say you're too funny and dope, then you're going to use that. Oh, absolutely. And then uh, I just sent him a message, said, oh, thank you very much for the, the props and all that. And he said, he said, no, I love it. And he said, do you play live? And I said, yes. Why? Do you want me to play? We'll support you. And then I didn't hear anything again. <laughs> God damn it. Because that would have been nice. I would like to support Chic. That would do the job. Yeah. But um, yeah, I was, at, I was at a wedding in Northern Ireland. Um, and a guy who was a former editor of Source magazine in the US, a sort of big American hip hop magazine, did say to me, and again, I use that as a post quote as well. He said, you're the only interesting thing that's happening in hip hop right now. <laughs> well, that, that said, it was like 2011. So maybe things have improved yeah. a bit since then. But um, yeah, there's been a few, a few things. But often, I don't know, the sort of hip hop community, is it? especially over here, is kind of tends to be a little bit, I don't know. You, it's just a bit unforgiving sometimes. Yeah. It tends to be more, you know, I get more sort of metal heads enjoying what I do than I do hip hop people. Well, th this is exactly it, isn't it? I mean, you've, you've got purists in all, uh, in all areas. Mm. Um, I, I get critiqued on the suits that I'm wearing and things like that. Oh, yes. What, what we like to refer to as the button brigade uh, <laughs> who yeah. will tell you that you're wearing the wrong collar with the bow tie that you've got on. Exactly, or, yes, yeah. They will, I mean, especially with me wearing, you know, sometimes wearing, well, usually kind of wearing shell toes or, or yeah. you know trainers right. generally sort of thing um and i do have to say to people you know that there, there is hop in chap hop yeah what well, so a shell yeah, toes rogues song very much exactly um, sums that up sums that up and actually it's what i've identified with um, good, i, I good. seem to remember you saying um at one point that purism was such a bore I think yes, probably, <laughs> probably is. yes. I, I'm definitely an anti-purist. I'm uh, yeah. I'm all for. But that's the thing. I, I'm a I'm a a postmodern child. Really, that's the thing. I, I I grew up in the time when people were mucking around with anything they could grab hold of, and I was always one of those people that liked. I didn't like anything that was just this type of music or that type of music. You know, I like to just mix everything up because I always figured that why? What's the point of just enjoying one type of music? when there's so much out there and in uh, the same time, what's the point of making just one type of music when you can make all of it? I think I, I, I was guilty of, of going in the opposite direction when I was younger. I was very much okay. rock and metal music as a teenager and that was it. And then punk rock. And, right. and those were the only types of music and I dismissed everything else. Yeah, completely. Well, no, yeah, I definitely. Older. Yeah, I definitely did that when I was much younger, when I was sort of 11, 12. <laughs> I guess it was like the early 80s, and it was a time when it was, everything was really tribal, and I became a rockabilly. Yeah. And, and, and then I got to know other rockabillies, who were, usually their kids were a bit older than me. And, you know, once you're in those little tribes, you yeah. can't... I remember a friend of mine at school catching me listening to The Art of Noise and going, what the fucking hell is this? <laughs> What do you think you're doing? I was like, oh, it's got like a 12 bar blues bass line at the start. It's kind of rockabilly. It's just like, it's not at all. <laughs> so, yeah, it was really, you had, to, you had to, you were kind of afraid to, yeah, to listen to something different. But it was that thing. It was very tribal then, where I think it's very different now. Every, everything's out there. So everything is, you know, people can take what they like. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is what culture is now, isn't it? It's just pinching from everywhere and kind of. Taking. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was reminded today, in fact, um, as, as a teacher, 
Um, right. Not, not a full-time teacher anymore. Um, I remember back in 2014, uh, Michael Gove, um, our then education secretary, <laughs> standing up and he wrote an article for the Mail or something about that, about how yeah. he, he liked chat pop. Um, and then reading your response to that. I mean, what were your feelings when you, when you heard that? Well, I heard that when... Uh, I think I was staying... I think we'd been up doing something in London and stayed at my folks' house, and then suddenly on the Sunday morning, my mum came bursting into the room, in their spare room, going, look at this, look at this! And it was me on like page five of the Daily Mail or something. Because obviously my parents, they, get, they do get the Daily Mail, but just because they're from the suburbs and it's, you know, it's one of those things that fooled everyone to think it was it's half, it, half a broadsheet, half a... People of a certain age, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it always made for a fun read and a fun... Little, yeah, I was just like going over there and annoying them by just commentating on it all and having, oh, you know, just being The only snipe. places I allow myself to read it is in Barbers, if it's on the side in the bar. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so then she came uh, bursting and going, look at this, look at this. There's a big picture of me and what have you. I would like to point out, though, that um, I wasn't, you know, it, he said, oh, I enjoy Professor Elemental, Mr. B, the Gentleman Rhymer, and the Correspondence. <laughs> and it seemed to be I was the one that was picked out. But I like to think that I was the one that's picked out because I had, as the Daily Mail said afterwards, Tory baiting lyrics. <laughs> so I thought, okay, yeah, if they pick me up because I'm the one that's the most, as yes, another poster quote I sometimes use at the end of the post, says, the Daily Mail, controversial. <laughs> so, controversial chap hop rapper, Mr. B the Gentleman Rhymer. Like, yep, if the Daily Mail are calling me controversial, I'm happy enough with that. But yeah, so that happened on the Sunday. Uh, and then... Oddly, The Guardian asked me to write a sort of response to it, which I wrote. And then the very same day, someone in The Guardian wrote a kind of little op-ed piece about chap hop, getting it completely wrong, just saying, oh, it's straight out of Kensington, it's posh boys and things like that. And it's, yeah. Yeah, just, I was thinking, why have you got me to write something and got this, whoever it was, who didn't actually, you know, they didn't show their name. <laughs> it was just a thing saying about how dreadful it oh, isn't it dreadful? Isn't it the worst thing you could ever imagine? Or, you know, yeah. Luckily, as well, you know, the comment section was just absolutely full of people going, you completely missed the point, and this is yeah. just a hatchet job, and what are you doing? Which was nice. <laughs> so I think that happened on the Monday, and then on the Tuesday, I was wandering into Brighton, and uh, I had a look at my phone, and I had an email, <laughs> and the title of which was Newsnight Invitation. <laughs> and I was like, oh, God, <laughs> this is happening. So I just thought, oh, sod it, come on, it can't, you know, it can't be all that bad. And I turned, so, yeah, I went up to London, I was at my brother's, he lives in South London, and I had to edit chap Hop history down to one minute. So literally the car, the cab had turned up, whatever, you know, the, the BBC car had turned up outside the door, while I was still, I was just finishing off the edit and sending it off to them. And then I turned up in the studio, and... Uh, yeah, walked in to see the backdrop of all these pictures of Michael Go, fo- his face photoshopped onto lots of like hip hop bodies and, oh, and like people with chains and tattoos and caps. And I was like, oh God, this is another case of not really getting yeah. the point. But there you go, I'm here now in the <laughs> belly of the beast. Um, yeah, then it went off. <laughs> it was such an odd evening. <laughs> went off to have my make- went off to have my makeup done. I was sat between uh, Jeremy Clarkson and what was her name? It was the woman that. Scottish was it Michelle Moan that who does uh, she's a the Scottish woman who runs some bra company or another oh, I, I couldn't I can't remember what it is but she was sort of sometimes on The Apprentice or something like that and she was there to talk about how there shouldn't be any death duty or something like that because she wants to keep all her money as rich people tend to um, that was <laughs> that was an interesting little exchange going on in there though starting off with Jez and walking and hello I'm Jeremy I was like oh, hello I'm Mr B and um, at one point he asked me if I'd ever met Bill Clinton. I was like, do you know who you're talking to here? <laughs> I'm like a low-grade musician who's just eking out a living doing gigs all over the place. And I happen to have ended up here. No, I haven't met Bill Clinton. Um, so he spoke a bit about King Bill Clinton, which was interesting. And we ended, I ended up in this very bizarre situation when this, uh, the, the bra lady had done some modelling shots for... British Airways and she was showing them to me and Jezza and we were kind of slightly squashed into a corner with her like just showing us these photos of her in swimsuits in front of aeroplanes <laughs> and me and Clarkson just going 
Every now and again, <laughs> like exchanging glasses. Uh, not Clarkson, I mean Paxman, sorry. Have I said Clarkson the whole time? You have said Clarkson, yeah. I, have I, I, had, I had a vision there. I had a vision oh, yeah. of you, Jerry Clarkson. Oh, it's completely God. changed now, now that you've said Paxman. Yeah, God, I said Clarkson, didn't I? I mean, Paxo's not been on the telly for a while, so yeah. And I've been sat on the beach all day, so I don't know what's going on anymore. <laughs> yeah, Paxo. Yeah, sorry, Paxo. Ex- exchange all the previous Clarksons for Paxmans, please, everybody. <laughs> and yeah so that happened then and then when I was actually doing the spot because the whole time it was all just oh this is kind of amusing and what have you then I finally had to stand on the spot ready to do a live one minute version to, to play the show out and suddenly the whole thing kind of slightly collapsed in on me I was like oh shit what am I doing here what is this oh god and they were showing a video of a report about sort of uh, war atrocities in Somalia that was to my right. Straight ahead of me, about 20 yards away, was, was Paxman. Paxman, not Clark. Paxman. <laughs> sat back in his chair with his hands behind his head going, looking forward to this. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking, what's going on? So I managed to squeeze my way through it and managed to get minor disses in by calling, when I had to say something about a ruddy popping jay, I made, made sure I pointed at Go so that everybody, you know, at least had an idea that, even though I was, um, you know, sort of introduced as Michael Go's favourite rapper, uh, yeah, you had to try and <laughs> you have to win the tiniest of battles that you can. Well, I seem to remember um, Professor Elemental saying that he had to scrub himself clean. <laughs> yes, possibly, yeah. <laughs> but then again, you know, it's not that he's in, entirely innocent and everything. We've, we've seen the, uh, I've, I don't know, some, some of us may have seen the footage of here on Sky TV's very own uh, sort of Britain's Got Talent type thing. <laughs> and we prof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, it was one of those things I thought, oh, sod it, I'll just do it. And it'll be over soon. I remember being in the uh, green room afterwards and talking to the editor. And he said, uh, he, you know, he said, oh, I'm texting Gove now. And he, t- <laughs> he sent Gove a text saying, basically saying, why don't you know, because Gove was always too scared to go on a face pack, so. Yeah. You know, rightly so, because he would have been eviscerated. But, um, I think he sent him a little message and what have you, and then he said he got a text straight back, and it just said, "Can you get me a signed photo?" <laughs> <laughs> so in the end, I think they took a photo of me. And I was holding up a sign saying, "I went on Newsnight," or "I was on Newsnight." Where were you, or something like that? Just in a kind of, "You're a big coward." I don't know. Um, I think, yeah, it was very uh, peculiar the whole thing, and yeah, it's almost been forgotten but obviously not quite <laughs> yeah. the reason i remember it is because um at the time i was teaching at a college and for those of you for those people who don't know because um, i've got lots of people probably listening to this in america uh, michael gove was the education secretary at the time who put in various draconian edu- education rules um that we were ranting about in the staff room and Michael fucking Gove um, yes. was the, 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 the thing that echoed around uh, the, the staff rooms within. Yes, I did hear of this. That's the thing. Having, I mean, I'm not in education and I have no kids, so I have no, no horse in this race, really. But I was fully aware of what an absolute <laughs> arse he'd been to everyone. Um, yes. There was one point where I bumped into him in Bedford Park while I was oh, really a dog. Um, Interesting. 2015 just as the election was happening they'd right. always been knocking on doors canvassing and, and that kind of thing and I was walking out the park with the dog and just stood in front of me was Michael Gove and at that point I could have had I had the prime opportunity to say something to him and I just went blank yeah it's tricky stared at him I'm sure yeah, I, I saw him. Boris Johnson in in on uh, Regent Street a few years ago after having popped down Savile Row and just, I don't know, you just, it's almost like you need time to come up with the best possible burn. Because <laughs> you know, you can't just do it on the spot. Even. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh, he's, the, oh, he's gone. <laughs> and the, and the other one was, I, I saw Nigel Farage at Goodwood Revival one year as well. God, really? Yeah. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's kind of almost a different kettle of fish altogether, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think violence Farage. might have been the... Uh, <laughs> yeah, or at least a milkshake. Yeah. <laughs> Just milkshake him. Find a milkshake. Yeah, there would have definitely been somewhere at Goodwood Revival selling milkshakes. <laughs> Just Probably very expensive milkshakes, though. 
Um, well, they would have been, yes. <laughs> but, but it would have been totally worth it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so a little bit about some of the other stuff that you do, because you've got an alter ego of the major, haven't you? And tell us a little bit about I that. have. Well, I seem to have a few alter egos. Actually, my <laughs> wife was saying yesterday, you need to just try and hone this down a little bit, because I tend to find, you know, I'll, I'll do a Mr. B album and um, what have you, and then I will freshen myself creatively by doing lots of other things so i've got the major which is which is still slightly it's still quite chappist it's um but it's more sort of wonky electronic beats slightly melancholy pastoral english psychedelic hip-hop instrumental hip-hop something like that but um yeah it's just it's quite a nice way of me to just freshen the mind creatively after having done you know done yeah a mr b album and i also do things on the name of jason roll bars as well but that's a, another kettle of fish altogether i do sort of you know lo-fi acid house music <laughs> under that thing but uh yeah that's a kind of separate thing he's he's over there somewhere <laughs> he's elsewhere you've got a kind of a, a a plethora of different um is that the right word there are, i think a plethora old, yeah a plethora <laughs> does the job yes but i think these are all you know parts of the uh, what i call the chap hop business concern yeah, so, which is kind of the label. I will do a compilation at some point of the chap hop business concern stuff because there's myself and Lady C did a thing under the name of the Eaton Manor Residents Association, <laughs> and uh, there's also a grime gaze thing that I'm doing, which I yeah I've not done a lot with yet, but which is sort of it, it's a uh, cross between shoe gaze and grime, so it's sort of washy distorted guitars over grime beats. Nice. Probably won't work, but who knows? <laughs> well, you've got to see. These things. You've got to see. Exactly, you, and you've got to keep it impure. That's the whole thing. But that's it. You've got to mix it up and keep it complete. This is the thing. Your your stuff is far edgier in many ways than the stuff that I do. I just write songs, and uh, um, my backing tracks are very, very simple in comparison to to, to what you do. I, well, I guess I'd kind of yeah. I, I've always sort of produced hip hop stuff or breaks stuff and things like that. So I, I wanted it to sound, you know, I wanted it to be the sort of stuff that people who, who like, you know, old music hall stuff would buy and people who like the banjo lady would buy and people who like chapism would buy, but people who like hip hop would also buy them or at least would not think is rubbish. I think that's the thing. I don't think anyone I know in that I know in hip hop that's listened to it has thought this is just a load of garbage. I think it's, you know, I like to, you know, I like to think my flow is decent enough. Yeah. I mean, I'd say you, the, the, definitely the later albums sound more a serious hip hop type thing, even though the lyrics are, are very, um, um, still very witty and uh, biting in many ways. Um, there's th- things like, um, uh, Shell Toes or Brogues. It's actually just a really good hip hop song, I would say. And and three piece suit and sneakers. I I just yes. I, I'm not hugely versed in hip hop, I have to admit. Um, but from my perspective, they they sound like the kind of song that you would hear in a club, and it wouldn't it wouldn't feel wrong if that makes sense. Yes, no, absolutely. Yeah, I, I that's exactly it. It's the sort of thing that people would think would listen to the track and think, oh, this is a kind of yeah, I like this, and then sort of suddenly this posh man would start rapping over it and people think and there's certain things that i know it's particularly with hip-hop if you do it's it's i'm very conscious that i don't want to fall into parody necessarily no. even though i do could do kind of you sort of parody stuff but um you know there's often there would be probably not so much now but still you know, still a few people that who do you know versions of hip-hop that would seem unexpected but they often they're sort of comedians who are having a go at it or you're not saying, making oh, isn't it of the genre you're, no, exactly. you're laughing it's... at the i guess posh british people not at the hip hop genre that... yes exactly yes yeah and yeah. i think that's the thing and and yeah i think that that's the main thing really that it's it's not and i've sort of slightly moved away as well from the kind of you know after 10 albums i think you shouldn't really have to still be explaining yourself yeah. <laughs> you know there's like oh this is what i do hey i am a chap but i'm doing hip-hop it's not yeah i think when with the chap trilogy i slightly thought okay i'm gonna put that whole thing to bed a little bit and just say you know 
I'm going to carry on going and doing this, but I don't wish to have to explain it to everyone all the time <laughs> because I've been doing it for 13 ruddy years. So if you don't get it now, just have a look at the old stuff and you'll get it. And obviously, yeah, and the first thing to do was much more a uh, playing up that, that thing because it was, <laughs> that's the thing, it was, you know, in 2007, it was a novelty. Where, you know, it was something unusual, whereas, you know, there's a few other people doing similar-ish things now and what have you and it's you know it's more that i'm okay this is this is my thing it's progressing isn't it i mean it, as, yes. as a musician you have to progress uh, yes. as the music matures and progresses and develops in various different ways yes and as as, as we were i think we we're both talking to the dapper villains podcast and saying yeah. that you know your style progresses as well as you go along there's certain things that i was wearing at the start i think definitely at the start there was def- it was much more well i didn't have like you know bloody 40 jackets or something like that to choose from like now it was like here's my smart jacket here's some smart trousers and a shirt and tie or a cravat let's have a go at this yeah and um yeah, you know you, much you are buying stuff for an act tax to yes as well. at the start and when i first did gigs it was i sort of had a beard and because i only had a few gigs i'd do a gig shave the bottom bit of the beard off and leave a sort of terrible ian beale moustache <laughs> and then and then uh and then grow the beard back and then there'd be another gig a couple of gig, uh, months later and then eventually there was a point when you know the decision had to be made because the gigs were piling up so and that's when it started to get the curl on and then everything after that kind of once the moustache started curling everything started yeah. falling into place really yeah i mean i i have attempted to do the curly moustache thing i i can't maintain it i have to keep a beard because i don't have a chin um well it gives me yeah. more of a manly jaw if I, if this I is can. true. Well, I do much the same these days. I see. I've, I've kind of. Well, obviously, we, you know, we're we're sort of in semi lockdown, so there's, you know, I don't have to go out and do gigs. But at the same time, I've not really properly shaved the bottom half for a while now. I like to keep a little bit of that. Yeah. yeah. Even though I have been, you know, trying to exercise, so I'm probably got a bit more of a chin than I did at the start of lockdown. I think people seem to go one way or the other in lockdown, yeah. as far as getting all fat or just sort. Of We've getting up and doing Joe Wicks of a morning. Reducing the amount of alcohol we've been drinking, um, I think, has been been helping a lot. Right. Have you done that as soon as lockdown started, or did it? Um, I think I just couldn't do all of this with a hangover. I think that is the right. The bottom line is we just thought this 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 is bad enough as it is, <laughs> but having to have a hangover <laughs> constantly because I know lots of people who have drunk through the whole thing. Um, yeah, I mean. Uh, I think maybe it's the, the sad thing for me is I don't tend to get hangovers. <laughs> it's, it's that, I'm that far gone that I, do, I just get up in the morning. It's fine. Not a problem. Um, yeah, no, I think we've, yeah, up and down. It's been, yeah. I think of, le- of the last few weeks, it's been a little bit more calm, especially as you can occasionally go to the pub. Yeah. We've not, we've managed to go to a pub garden so far. We've not been out to a pub as of yet. Yeah, we've, yeah, I think we've mainly done pub. I was going to go and, um, uh, watch some footy on the telly in the pub tonight and I've kind of I think the in-laws are coming down and at the weekend so I think I'm probably not going to do that now because I think it would be indoors and with some people I don't really know so I think I'm, I might give it a miss and if it's football people shouting and that kind of thing yeah they'll probably be shouting and all that sort of thing so I don't yeah it's not ideal much as I'd like to go and just have drinks in a pub and how tempting that seems I might just uh, yeah <laughs> give it a swerve this time um, so going back to the the hip hop, uh, uh, sorry, the chap hop um, thing, um, I would say that you were the creator of chap hop in many ways. Uh, well, I think so. I think as far as I can, I can always say that I am the inventor of the, the term chap hop. Yeah, because I know that our good friend the prof was doing this similar thing to me around about the same time. Yeah, but um, I think he was saw his as you know Victorian hip hop or after a bit steampunk hip hop, whereas mine was very much, it all kind of came to me at, at once in a way in the pub. And I just <laughs> said, right. These I'm things gonna... tend to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I'd enacted a thing with this, a, a group of friends who, you know, we became known as Club Mercury, which actually features in my little Mr. B novel, Roast Beef. Now they all meet up, Mr. B and his uh, crew yeah. meet up at Club Mercury. And um, I do intend to actually release, release a um, sort of a, a, almost like a, well, I don't know, a fanzine stroke pamphlet called Mercredist International, which will be the <laughs> Club Mercredi magazine at some point. I might try and do that for Christmas, but suddenly you think of doing things for Christmas and suddenly 
actually it's September. I should have probably got it all together by now. But anyway, it, it, that's it neither here nor there. Like it's time at the moment. I, I, I yes. Know, I, it could be September. It could be December. Yeah. Well, especially today, is it's absolutely glorious. Yeah. And here we are, sat indoors, <laughs> like fools. <laughs> <laughs> but yes but as I say yeah I, I kind of came at the whole thing almost I'm pretty sure I was just in one one little sitting I was like oh, that's what it's going to be it's going to be I'm going to be called Mr. B the Gentleman Rhymer and it's going to be called Chap Hop and I initially intended it to be I'll do the whole thing from a Chesterfield armchair but then the practicalities of that yeah. dawned on me and I thought okay well let's not do that <laughs> for one, you can't, it's hard to play the banjolady in a Chesterfield armchair and it would mean I would have had to drag a Chesterfield armchair around to all my gigs which would have been somewhat troublesome I mean, I, I've been chatting to um, Tom Carradine, uh, oh, yes. Carradine's Cockney sing-along, um, and he talked talking about dragging his piano along to bury. Yes, it. yeah. He's had to stick it on wheels. Um, so, yeah, dragging a Chesterfield around, I could imagine, wouldn't be yes. for that. I mean, bless him, he does, yeah, I mean, he really does, I mean, rather than just getting a little, I've got a little, what's it, a Roland Go piano or whatever it is, <laughs> a really lightweight thing, because I sometimes play piano at gigs. Um, but yeah, he goes for the full, the full upright gamut, doesn't he? It's, yeah, more power to him. Well done. It's yeah. I think there was a thing because having been in bands and what have you for years, it was just a real relief to just turn up with one thing on the back and a bit of merchandise. It's great, isn't it? It's lovely. Yeah, it does the job. Providing they're not expecting me to provide a, a PA system. The PA, yes. I find that with weddings, you have to be careful with that. If people book you for a wedding, you do have to go. You, must, you, know, you have to provide the PA because early on I did a couple and they were like, where's your speakers? You're like, oh, <laughs> uh, that's interesting. And then you sort of end up hooking things up to a little home stereo or <laughs> and having a go. I, I had that, um, yeah, because I was playing a gig on the Isle of Wight um, for a, a festival and they, their PA had, for some reason, they, they hadn't been able to get hold of the PA. And so I had to use someone. So that was a good warning for me that actually I should check the PA every single time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But you, that's the thing. You always think at a festival they, they would have something. But yes, yeah, sometimes they don't. Oh, yes. <laughs> no. I remember I was going on after this sort of big sort of swing band, who you know, sort of 12-piece band and everything like that. And then as they were packing away, I just noticed they were packing away all the speakers as well. <laughs> like, what? Uh, there were... Uh, what, what? Okay. Oh, have you not got your own? Does it? You really don't really know how festivals happen, do you? You don't just every band turns up and sets up a PA and then breaks it down again. But yeah, I mean, I that have been to festivals where that happens. I have turned up and seen, and and sometimes people have all of this huge amounts of kit because there's five of them and they all are just mad for technology. And yes. Huge speakers and they spend two hours sound checking. And then you go on and you do little kind of... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sounds fine to me. Takes you five yeah. seconds just to... Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that can be tricky. I, f- I forget what we were talking about. Um, I, think we were to- I think we were talking about how I came up with it or some of that. Did we do Chap- that? Chap- yeah, Chap- that was... Yeah, it seemed like a while ago. Elemental, you had this uh, rivalry with, with Professor Elemental. Was that... Well, let's, let's say let- he had the rivalry. I didn't have the rivalry. I wasn't bothered, but he had a bee in his bonnet. Bless him. <laughs> so was it was it a a made up thing or was it semi serious? Do we think? I think I think it was a bit of both. <laughs> I think I, was, I think I can only, I, you know, I can't speak for him really, but I, I can only guess. But I think what happened was we'd I mean, I've been doing it for a year or so, and then it was um, uh, this guy Jimmy from the Bobby McGees, who were a sort of ukulele based tweecor band from Brighton. <laughs> And uh, Brighton has all of these different. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> We're all in Brighton. Yeah, everybody's in. Yeah. Maybe I should just, let's just assume everything's from Brighton unless I say so. I yeah. think that's. <laughs> but um, yeah, he just said, I think, well, I, I can't remember why, but we, I saw him in Camden. We were having a chat outside the bar, for, bar fly in Camden. And he said, Oh, you, you must know Professor Elemental. I was like, Oh, no, no. And he said, Really? He goes, What? He does that thing almost exactly like you. I was like, Really? So I kind of went home afterwards and found Professor Elemental and thought, oh, shit. And then I thought, oh, double shit, because he had about 100,000 views of a Cup of Brown Joy by then, yeah. and I'd only just had straight out of Surrey out. So I was like, oh, God. But um, anyway, we kind of met, I think we met at a public enemy gig in uh, Brixton Academy. 
And uh, yeah, I had a little chit chat there. And then we didn't really see each other for maybe another year or so. And then suddenly somebody I think sent me a message on Facebook and said, have you seen this? And it was him doing fighting trousers live, his sort of diss track to me. I was like, okay, interesting. And then he actually sent me an email and a while later and said, oh, I just thought I'd let you know I'm putting a, a video out for fighting trousers. I thought it would be the only gentleman he just to let you know. I was like, okay, fine. And obviously that went, you know, the interesting thing about that was seeing loads of my mates from Brighton in the video and thinking, <laughs> you fucking turn <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bumpy girl called Ono, who's a sort of Amazonian redhead lady who was in the video and uh, I remember bumping into her in Kemp Town in Brighton and she would like a little while after us, bless her, she was really like, oh, I'm really sorry, oh, just, it was just a video, I thought it would be fun to be in a video, I didn't know it was dissing you. I was like, it's fine. So, um, <laughs> But then we met up for a drink a little while after that. And um, yeah, he went and got a drink and he sat down and um, I straight away said, look, first things first, I'm not buying your style. I didn't know anything about it. He went, oh, I know that. He goes, I just always wanted to do a diss track and you were the first person to come along that I could do it to. <laughs> uh, okay, fair enough. Well, but, uh, thing, uh, Madam Misfit, have you the, the, the diss track? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Done. For all three of us now, I was, I was yes, of course, yeah. Honored to fit, to be included within that, to be quite honest. Well, you're in now. That's <laughs> it. You're you're in the uh, the circle of trust, circle of mistrust. <laughs> you're in there now. Well, you know, yeah. But obviously, this you know, this is it. You you know, you've you've been in a position more more than the rest of us. Really, we were, you know, by the time when you oh, got a million views, bloody hell, I can't believe it. When you're like. <laughs> on Facebook, like 85, 90 million views. Like, okay, that's a different level altogether. Yeah, Facebook, as one of my students pointed out to me, though, it's, Facebook views don't really count because they're only like three seconds and it counts it as a view. Okay, it, maybe. Yeah, I've but it's still... views on Facebook and, and my students said, well, come back to me when you've got a million on YouTube and then I'll, and then I'll be impressed. <laughs> well, have you had a million on YouTube? Well, I have now, yeah. But... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. That's good. Uh, yeah, I guess so. But at the same time, it's still, you know, it was everywhere, wasn't it? For that, that, yeah. that January last year, well, last year before, yeah, year before last, year. Uh, last year, yeah, it was everywhere. And uh, God, I mean, thing is, <laughs> I bet you the number of times I got sent it was just, <laughs> I was like, yes, 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 yes. I know. I love it. It's great. But yeah. don't send me this anymore. I think I did put a thing to say, here's a great, great video. Please don't send it to me anymore, everybody. The one I got recently was um, the old guy playing the piano saying, singing Stay the Fuck at Home. I don't know if you saw oh, that. Oh, yes. Not yeah, that. yeah, yeah. That was all over my page, people sending that to me. Because he's used the word fuck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're, you're the fuck guy. You're a fuck boy. <laughs> I think that's what he's on now. You're officially a fuck boy. <laughs> in a certain way uh, yes yeah. but no yeah I see the Madam Misfit one that was very nice it was yeah. um, well the thing is it wasn't really a diss at all was it it was well my my verse anyway it was just really lovely it was just going about how great it was it was like brilliant Listen, like, keep dissing me like this please come on diss me diss me more <laughs> attention it's just <laughs> attention it's just that attention and uh, yeah so yeah I was I was very happy with my verse <laughs> it was very pleasant <laughs> Um, so, your latest album, Thoroughly Modern Existential Crisis. Uh, yes. Did you, was that written in lockdown? It was, yes, written in its entirety in the first month or so of lockdown. It seems to be happening. Like, sometimes I think that I'll tend to often plan things for months and months and months and think, oh, I really want to make this album brilliant. I want to make it absolutely, you know, just really perfect. And sometimes you think that's just pointless just yeah make you know get stuff written down get it on tape get it on you know just make the stuff and it'll be fine if you procrastinate over things too much yeah i have, to, I uh, have to get going and just do it yeah this is true yeah Never and i think this is why i often do other things in between albums so just to so that i'm not thinking right well as, you know someone said to me our friends of uh damien who runs skint records or used to run it then didn't and now does again i think um, and he just said, look, can you just stop making stuff for a minute and <laughs> promote it? <laughs> I guess, you know, you want to make an album, you know, that's usually the easy bit. What you need to do is promote it and make sure people know about it. And I was like, yeah, but, you know, I just like doing other stuff. And then usually he says, every time I see you, you've like done another book or 
or <laughs> another album or something or other or uh, an animation or something like that but at the same time it's you know it seems to be like you say it takes a while to get started and once you get started actually but the first i wrote my first bit of new lyrics today on the beach for a, there we go that's, that's a, a new title of a song it seems have you got that uh, yeah is that right the right way yeah red brick municipal buildings so that I mean that's your process then do you start with your lyrics or do you start with your beats or how do you I think I've got a very there's... definite way of, of writing mine. I tend to start with lyrics and then a tune will come into my head that will annoy me so much that eventually I'll have to kind of expand on that. Right, yeah, yeah. It was interesting to hear how other people do it. It's sort of, well, this, yeah, this, you know, Thoroughly Modern Existential Crisis, which, I mean, it's clearly it was, um, I'd started making these little hunker down diaries for YouTube and just, you know, babbling away. And I thought, well, I'd best, you know, do some tunes for it as well, just because that's what I do, so... I started writing a couple of silly things. I think I did Wipe to Beige, uh, the uh, version of Visage's Fade to Grey, <laughs> as during the, um, the great toilet roll drought yeah. of March oh 2020. God. That feels like an age ago now. <laughs> I know, isn't it? There's so many odd little stages. I think this one, actually, I think I might end up doing two. I don't know if it'll be necessarily a lockdown album, but I, t- I tend to keep things semi-topical. Yeah. So I guess just by the nature of the way time's going and the way this whole thing is going, it's probably going to be a, a second lockdown album probably. But um, yeah, so it's sometimes, sometimes it'll be lyrics that I'll, you know, hear a little tune of whatever the chorus will be. Often it's just, I'll have a title or something like that. I guess maybe you're probably the same as that, you know, you'll get a title or a theme. Something or, will come into your head. And- yeah. Then, then you find almost a way of putting it that has a rhythm to it. Yes, so, yeah, exactly. So, for example, my email song, very uh, annoying emails that could be... Could yes, yeah, yeah. Meetings that could be emails. And then you find something that works as a, a line, I guess, of a song. Exactly, yeah, that scans along with whatever it is. Yeah. So, yeah, often it'll start with a title. Sometimes I'll just make... You know, I just I do tend to sit making beats and what have you, um, which is the uh, hip hop way of just saying tunes. <laughs> which is, <laughs> so, yeah, making beats. Well, it's, it's got stuff on it as well. It's got some bass and and keyboards and banjo lady. It's it's a beat. But um, yeah, so I'll sit around just noodling around anyway, and so I think there's some yeah, there's a few things that I've done, which is, I'm planning on being for the next major album what have you i think you know as in album by the major not major album but um might end up being mr b things now i think because i've started yeah. also it's one of the, the, the thing like i said when you some wake up and think what am i and i kind of think okay what i need to be doing is mr b is what i do that is you know that's my thing really and like yeah lady c was saying you know you you're sort of over diversifying really you're trying to do this and that i've started doing some art some lino prints and what have you well, which i'm yeah. going to start selling which you know. I mean, i've started doing these chats with people and really they could just take over um, mm. but ultimately they take a lot of time and effort setting it up and then editing yes. and, and doing all those kind of things um and it, yeah i don't necessarily i think this is probably going to be the last one for a while Right. Okay. You can you can get distracted by those little things, and that becomes the thing that you do. Yeah, but it's also, I mean, that's also, you know, if something does take a long time to do, or it takes, you know, it's quite time consuming as of itself. Then it can be. I'm a friend. I've got a friend who's a graphic designer and a potter, and he sort of left a graphic design design job to be a potter, and he's done that for a few years. Now he's, he's sort of going, kind of doing a bit more design stuff now because. <laughs> I'm just sitting all day, every day, making pots for shops. And it's driving me a bit mental. And well, I quite like to go back to doing this again. So it's nice to have, yeah. it's nice to have pots on the boil. Yeah. But I, the other thing for me was selling merch as well, is the T-shirts and the badges were selling quite well when I was promoting them. So I kept promoting them. And then mm. you're going to go, but I've now got to package all of these up and post yeah. them all out. And I'm now becoming a T-shirt seller. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I say I'm quite lucky. My my father-in-law does pretty much all my merchandise sending out. So what I should do really is actually be promoting it more. Whereas I, I'm really terrible at promoting that end of things. I think I've not done 
I tend to think everything has to be brand new. So if it's not new, I tend to forget it for a while. And what I should be doing is like flogging that stuff because there's boxes of it in my studio. So yeah. Yeah, I should be getting there's that stuff out there. A bit now because we've not been gigging. And I just yeah. got a batch of CDs and T-shirts and things like that that I was hoping to sell on a tour. Yes, exactly. I mean, that's the thing as well. It's, I've not done uh, a thoroughly modern existential crisis as a CD or, a, or vinyl um, at all because... I don't. Know, I know there's people that would like to have that, yeah. but they really sell mostly, you know, at gigs. I mean, I do sell them, you know, a fair few online, but I just thought. Also, I'd kind of released it on the Bandcamp, at, you know, royalty amnesty day, so you know, to try and get a bit of extra cash. So, um, yeah, I, I think I might maybe if this, if I do another album, perhaps I'll package them both in one CD or something like that. Yeah. Or do a, a double pack thing or something. I don't know, but. Uh, yeah, I just thought I'd just keep it online and also just save a little hassle. And, also, and, and my father-in-law at the time when I was doing it was, you know, he's, he's had numerous medical problems, so he's kind of shielding. And I didn't want to be <laughs> just sending him off to the post office every day with a load of stuff. So, yeah, that would have been a bit wrong. Yeah. So talking gigs, actually, you did... Have you done more than one drive-in gig or is it just the one drive-in gig? Just the one, actually, yeah. Just, just one drive-in gig, yeah. How the whole time. It was fun. It was really good fun, actually. It was interesting. It was, I mean, it was, as my dad would say, it was certainly a bit different. <laughs> um, it was, um, obviously, yeah, the whole thing was really, you know, was well set up. I think that it was co-run by a kind of a live gigging tech firm. So they were really on it as far as all the tech went. And uh, there were cars set back about 20 yards and they had picnic tables in front of them. Right. So people could kind of get out of their cars and what have you. But if they wanted to... I never to saw the pictures of the actual crowd at all. All I saw was you on stage and the sound of the car horns going. Yes, the car horns. I mean, that was, that was kind of interesting. Having, you know, rather than singing along, I just get everyone to toot their horns because there's lots of, <laughs> lots of call and response and lots of singing along that happens. And I'm just getting people to toot their horns. So it was like, you know, rather than saying, oh, hell, the chap, it was just... <laughs> so that was interesting. It was, actually, it was actually really good fun and kind of went really well, but it's not the sort of thing you could do all the time. I've got a couple of things booked in for October, which are indoor gigs, but reduced capacity. But you know, who knows what's going to happen? Well, yeah. Weeks. The things are obviously going a little bit wrong again. For uh, October, November, December, January, but I'm not holding any hope really at the moment. No. And these ones are, you know, specifically reduced capacity. So it's like 30 or 40 people in a kind of two or 300 or 300 people venue. Mm. But we, yeah, we're just going to have to see week on week what happens. Okay. And also, the also problem with it is, is that people can't, you know, people aren't really allowed to sing along. So uh, they'll, I'll have to again do, maybe I'll take some little bicycle horns along and put them <laughs> on the tables or something. I don't know. <laughs> There's going to have to be some way of people making a noise that is uh, not vocal. No. This, where do you see all of this going um, if things don't, um, improve in terms of the COVID situation? Well, I, think, I mean, I think things will improve. But these things do go away, I think, you know, really, you know, Spanish flu, I suppose it lasted like three years, two and a half years, something like that. So, you know, it could, it could well be the case that we're not gigging until maybe late next year. Yeah. But, yes, I mean, I know this, you know, particularly people, it's kind of people in the, say, cabaret circuit and what have you, who like you know we can record we can record stuff and yeah you know give things to people that you know what have you but people like you know burlesques and what have you who performance is is everything it's you know it's, it's a hard it's yeah. a hard time and you do you know you say you do find yourself waking up in the morning and go what what am i am i am i just a bloke now what, am i just some bloke who's unemployed is that what i am <laughs> i'm not a chap up superstar anymore i don't know have you done many of the um, the online live stream gigs? I've done a few. Well, what I I have got is my Tuesday night in isolation parties, yeah. and they've been they've been fantastic actually. They've been really really good fun, and I've got a kind of crowd of people. I start them on Facebook. It was actually on my birthday. It was my <coughs> birthday this year, and uh, yeah, I did I did one for that because I thought well, I was you know we had a big party booked and there's gonna be lots of great people playing and what have you and it obviously didn't happen 
Um, so I just did thought I'm just going to DJ at home and stream it on Facebook. And I did that for about three weeks. And obviously things would, it being Facebook, it would get taken down every 40 minutes or so, or when I was playing something from, from a major label. Yeah. And so I just say, right, refresh the page and we'll start again. And, and I refreshed and refreshed and refreshed until one Wednesday morning, I woke up and my Facebook page was gone. It said, your fa- page has been deactivated. I thought, oh, bugger. So that was a little panic because, uh, yeah, they, they let me back in, in a couple of, after a couple of days. But I was like, oh, God, this is bad. Yeah. Also because I hadn't, you know, it was my personal page, but I hadn't authorized anyone else to have access to the Mr. B page. Yeah. So I still haven't actually, I still need to do that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just kept it, I'm keeping it safe. But I moved over to the Mixcloud because they just started doing, um, and it was in sort of beta testing, but they just started doing live video streaming on that and i found you know on on my birthday it was maybe like 120 people or something uh, listening but then i went over to mixcloud and suddenly there was like 500 people on there wow and it was really yeah you get you know quite a decent crowd and then in the little chat everyone started i mean this is the 20th one this week uh, tomorrow night and people started uh sort of kind of getting to know each other a bit on the chat and they've now formed a little they have called themselves the nice biscuits and uh they've started their own little facebook group which i'm a member of and so it's you know it's and it's become it's become really it's such a lovely thing it's one because i just absolutely love doing it and it's just great because i i've always so i've been a dj for years and years anyway i was actually i was actually john peel's uh, party dj of choice you know I DJ'd at John Peel's wife's 50th and then John's 60th and his 65th just shortly before he, before he died. Short by accident, me and my brother. It was my brother that got the gig for us. But yeah, so that was kind of nice. Um, but anyway, that's enough of that name dropping and showing off. <laughs> yeah, so it was, I hadn't really to properly... I have my radio show on 1BTN uh, yeah. radio and yeah, I've done a few things like that. But it's nice to actually kind of do a kind of party and DJ... Yeah. Where people um, can respond to it, I guess, as well. And I guess yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not. It's just a one-way stream, so it's not. I can't. It's not like Zoom. I can't see them dancing about or what have you. But they do send put post up videos of them dancing about and what have you. And it's really become for some of them. It's become a real like this is the highlight of their week. They all yeah. just can't wait to get involved, and they've all kind of got to know each other. So everyone sometimes I'm kind of almost sort of stop it go like is anyone listening to this or are you just talking about real ale or something like that or or wherever else they, or whoever's doing what this week i guess it's like being at a nightclub isn't it it's like being out and socializing with your mates at a nightclub music yeah place. yeah but you can actually hear what people are saying yeah <laughs> rather than i don't just know getting... much about mixed cloud then so what is mixed cloud well mixed cloud is it's generally speaking it's been you know it's for djs to put mixes up on and usually it's an audio thing and you just upload a whole like an hour long mix or what have you. And I've done it a few times before. There's a, a load on mine of, you know, from way back from when I started doing, doing Mr. B of, you know, kind of weird sort of Bonzo dog doodah band stuff and old music hall things and some big, uh, big band stuff and hip hop as well. And, you know, just a real, a real mix up. But um, yeah, they just started doing like a live streaming video thing now and the thing with mixcloud is it's they pay royalty so you know yeah. they'll have these bots that listen to the tracks and those that those that are registered or what have you for prs people will get paid for them yeah i think or anyway it's you're allowed to play whatever you like basically it's a similar which thing is great YouTube. um youtube will do a shared royalty thing with copyrighted tracks and right stuff. okay i'm not sure about Act, the actual recording of the track so definitely for covers if i'm playing a cover track right? right yes yeah yeah and obviously facebook now i've just gone full on evil that's about it and just going nope we're not letting you do anything anymore that's it I'd look looking at alternatives at the moment shall we say yeah well mixed cloud's a really good one it's 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 good enough luckily i mean i've been having doing mixes on there and little radio shows and so a lot of my original one btn radio shows are all on my mixed cloud that are now on the one btn mixed cloud but um, yeah, so yeah. I've got a kind of a few thousand people on there. Do they have Sorry? bands doing gigs and live streams on there at all? Um, I think they must. Yeah, they must do. Really, because you're allowed to do whatever you like on there. So it's you know, if you, it's just it's just live video. You know, you can do whatever the heck you want, really. 
I thought it was video, not just audio. Yes, it's video as well. So, and I mean, you do it via like a third party app or what have you. You use like OBS for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I which is something which I need to get to grips with because I use everything's just one camera angle at the moment. And I know that you can use different scenes and switch between them, but I've never really got that. I'm yeah. not that techie on a visual front. Yeah, I'm currently playing around with that. Um, the advantage I've got um, is as of this month, I've got students back in college who do media production. That's uh-huh. the project I teach. And one yes, of the yeah. things my degree students are going to be doing for me is a live stream gig with multi cameras. So there you go. <laughs> Lovely. Very good. <laughs> use that as a. So if, yeah. you, if you want a multi camera gig, Jim, okay. Uh, come over to Bedford. All right. Well, actually, I did that in High Wycombe a little, uh, just at the start, just before, just before we went into lockdown, about a week or so before lockdown, I went to uh, Bucks New University in High Wycombe. And, uh, I think I saw the video of that, actually. Yes, yeah, I've put a few of them up, yeah. So that was a great, you know, I was, I was badgering the hell out of them. Going, Can you send it over? Can you send it over? <laughs> uh, okay, we're just getting it together. I'm like, just send it. And then students take ages of doing all of those kind of things as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. But it's nice. That's the thing, you know, it's, I've certainly released more videos than ever before yeah. on YouTube. But at the same time, there's, with putting more videos up, tends to come less and less views as you go <laughs> along and be like, oh, yeah, he's putting another video up. Whereas before, it's kind of, either they're kind of like, okay, it's him again, so what? Or you put one up after six months and everyone assumes that you're dead if you yeah. don't put videos up for a few months on YouTube. You get loads of people that you, know, you put a video up after a while and people go, God, I thought you died. <laughs> no, I've just been recording or something. I, I think know. I think I've shot myself in the foot. I've been doing one every week, at least one video every week, mm. um, and that becomes hard to maintain. Uh, yes, once you've set yourself up for doing that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm looking at ways of of reducing that amount. But the, the thing is, is there's no gigs, and so there's nothing else to do. Yeah, this is uh, true. You know, I've monetized YouTube videos now, so even though it's pennies really with the youtube videos yeah um you know what i've never actually done that either which is very foolish although that said you know unless you, unless you can backdate it to 2008 yeah. it's probably not really worth it for me <laughs> but you might as well start monetizing it now because it's it's, it's it's in watch hours so it's mm. the number of watch hours that you've accrued i think it's okay fun. you have to have a certain number of subscribers and a certain number of watch hours right okay um which was frustrating when no more fucks went viral because I hadn't at that point had enough. <laughs> to be able to right. Yeah. Right away. Um, They've always got you somehow. Yeah. 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 That's somewhat annoying. Um, so finally, have you got anything in the pipeline coming up? Any particularly exciting things coming up in the future? Um, what have we got? Well, I'm going to start. I'm just about to start writing another well, it was, you know, it was one of those things that possibly it was going to be an EP, but usually if I start doing an EP, it turns into an album relatively quickly. Yeah. So um, there will be a new, a new album coming out at some point in the not too distant future, but we'll see. I'm just going to start recording that in the next couple of weeks. I've got to get my double bass back off a friend who I've lent it to and all that sort of thing. Um, so there's that. What else am I doing? I'm, well, actually, you know, I know you started one. I'd, I've been meaning probably for about four years to start a Patreon page. Yeah. And I've still not really got around to it because I keep thinking, oh, well, it's too late for that now. And I was thinking that in 2016. So I'm an <laughs> idiot, basically. I could have been making a nice little bit of money every month. But then this part of me, because I'm such a lazy swine, I was like, oh, but then I'd have to do stuff. Yeah. But then I'd do stuff anyway, and there's no gigs. So <laughs> I'm going to pull my finger out and get the Mr. B Patreon page off the ground, which is probably going to be called Mr. B's Guild of Chap Hop. I need a better name for my Patreon page and my fans because it's just Thomas Benjamin Wilder Squire. Yes, well, I mean, it's, you know, it is, it does what it says on the tin, you know, it's, uh, yeah, sometimes I think I do, I try and complicate things too much with all these different <laughs> things, but it's, that's been the plan for it for a, a while. So I think there is a page, but I've not properly put it together yet you know i had to complete it i've got the i've got the url or whatever it is i don't even remember what it is it does but, uh, take a while of thinking about all of the benefits that you're going to put on there for all the different levels yes exactly those kind of things yeah there is that so i, I will finally get around to doing that at some point and i'm going to be studying some of my art on the uh yeah 
on the thing. Where's, oh, have I got some art over here? Well, there was some on the table, but now it seems to have gone over the other side of the room. So look, I'll show, I'm going to show you a lino print. Hold on a second. But so you're a man of uh, many right then. talents there. I suppose so, yes. Well, I'll tell you what. Well, haven't you? Yes, I try and yeah do stuff. I'm going to do it. Yeah, there's going to be another animation soon, which I'm going to start as soon as possible. For there's a track on on a thoroughly. I was thinking before I do the new album, there's a track on a thoroughly modern existential crisis called the house. Yeah, which um, going around been, in my head for absolutely months. That song. Excellent. That's what we like to. That's what we like to hear. And it was played. Yeah, Steve Lamac played it on Six Music a few times. I think so. It's definitely one that caught the eye, and everyone really liked it. And it's quite. It's a melancholy one. It's got strings yeah. and everything which is really rather nice. But, um, so yeah, I'm going to do an animation for that. But I did, I had an interesting, <laughs> interesting part of these, this art thing, these little lino prints I've been doing. I had an interesting evening out a few weeks ago, meeting up with my wife's old friends and her, and a chap, she, uh, her boyfriend. And he, I was talking, you know, we were talking about whatever we did and I talked about art and I said, I'd, uh, I said, I'd done this, which is, uh, <laughs> A lino print of Barry Chuckle, which I did just after he died. I, that's the thing to be the thing that happens is I, well, I was going to do, you know, I started doing an exhibition called Final Cut, which is going to be the last, you know, the last known photos of, of dead celebrities, basically. But um, yes, this chap said, oh, I'm friends with, I'm friends with Paul Chuckle. And uh, I saw him fiddling about with his phone. He goes, oh, can you send me a picture of that? So I sent him a picture and uh, a couple of minutes later, <laughs> I was in the bar and this, Paul came through like an unknown number. I looked up and this guy was going, so I said, hello. He went, All right, is that Jim? I was like, yeah, it's Paul. And he's going, can you send us one of them? He goes, and they said, basically there's, um, was it Gulliver's World or something like that? They've got uh, Chuckle Town in Gulliver's World. I think it's like a little theme park thing. And uh, they wanted to, he wanted to put a copy of it up in Chuckle Town. So I sent one off and I think that's going to be going up there and they're going to invite me up. To Whereabouts is that then? I think it's in Mansfield. I think it's like three of them or something. But one's in Mansfield. So I think it was that one. That, um, That's a Gulliver's World. I'm pretty sure in. there's one near Milton Keynes as well. Yeah I, think there, yeah, I think there may well be. I think there's three of them around about. One in Mansfield and a couple a bit further south. So yeah, that's going in there. I did one. Of course, I'm quite pleased with this one. This is the Andy Weatherall one. But when he went, it's like, Lovely. fail we may, sail we must. <laughs> what else have we got? What else have we got here? Uh, oh, that's the that's the Prince one. That's that that's the last photo of Prince getting in his car after going to the uh, the chemist to get the drugs that killed him. <laughs> and it says party over. Oops, out of time. But um, yeah, so I'm, I did have a little exhibition in in St Leonard's, like Hastings, at the end of last year. And I think there's loads of stuff still there because I had the exhibition. Then we went into lockdown, and I've not been over there since to pick things up. They might still be on the wall, as far as I know. I don't know. But um, so yeah, I'm going to try and flog a few of those. So that's the thing that's happening. So yeah, new new bits and bobs, new isolation parties every every Tuesday, which is uh, mixcloud.com/live/gentlemanrhymer, um, and they happen every Tuesday. I'm thinking about doing a a charity all nighter version of it, which will be fun. The problem is at the moment my wife's working in the she works in films and she's working in the studio now. She's working on a Wednesday which means she has to get up about five o'clock on a Wednesday morning where I'm like up till whatever time DJing and going, come on, everybody. I'm getting a little bit tiddly uh, and try not to overdo it. Well, but, it's, uh, but that's like become... a new Saturday night, I guess, is it? Cause it's... I think so, yeah. This is very much it. Everyone kind of seems to be looking forward to Tuesdays. It doesn't... Tuesday. It doesn't mean anything when you haven't got to go to work, I guess, do they? This is true, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm looking, you know, what I need is another locked, full lockdown, then everyone will be on there. So, uh, yeah, bring it on. Okay, um, I'm going to finish with you chatting to you there. Um, right, you are. I didn't give you the warning that I was going to chuck one of your tracks at the end of this for people uh -huh. to listen to. Um, have you got any preference for which one you'd like me to put at the end? Um, well, maybe as I was just talking about it, maybe maybe the house. Yeah, that'd be a good that's one. The one that stuck in my mind from the new album. All right. Yeah, good. Um, so, uh, just leaves me to say, uh, Mister B, the gentleman rhymer, thank you very much for joining me. Um, old chum. 
and here is The House. Flanning it up in the British summer Then a house in the middle of a suburban South London street Brought out to me Less than exquisite It bid me to quiz it I asked it Is it possible to visit the good old days But all was great Because people around here seem scared of late The house said That's just human nature People are easily fooled Or fake to Born in this place You only see so far Unless you look properly Then you see past The kind of nostalgia The spot of fast An empty shell A plaster cast They worry about it too late Then invent a cop out A foolhardy sentiment like Wouldn't we just love things to be The way that we imagined That they used to be Young, with your awkward ways and your silent tongue Mean care follows with fretful lines I've been tarted up but I'm the same inside Same foundations, walls and space Same frustrations set in place About past glories which were never there But I was and still am Constant stoic, unheroic Bricks and mortar and episodic mold That flares up when it's cold Just more signs I'm getting old People want to feel assured When they're both scared and rather bored So they dive into a lie about the past And times gone by They sing Wouldn't we just love things to be The way that we imagined that they used to be But actually weren't But actually weren't Wouldn't we just love things to be The way that we imagined that they Actually won't Actually once. 